Good afternoon, good morning, Sabah al Khair, Bokir Tov. Um, we are starting now our first joint webinar in the US of IPPNW, the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, and METO, the Middle East Treaty Organization. And um, without saying much more, my name is Sean Dolev, I'll be the moderator. I'm the executive director of the Middle East Treaty Organization and our next speaker. Uh, and I'm very delighted to have you with us, Dylan. It's Dylan Williams, uh, a senior vice president for policy and strategy at J Street, a nonprofit advocacy group working to promote American leadership to end the Arab Israeli and Israel Palestinian conflicts peacefully and diplomatically. Dylan has been named one of the Hill's top lobbyists uh, six years in a row and leads uh, the government's affairs team at J Street. Dylan, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Aaron, uh, and I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak here. I'll be very brief uh, so to leave as much time as possible for, for questions. Um, it's almost needless to, to say that, uh, but I'll say it anyway, that for uh, Israel uh, and Israel supporters around the world, security is a paramount concern uh, that dominates politics, uh, nightly discussion around the dinner table, etc. Et and that's obviously uh, the case for many countries, but in Israel's case, it, it does face a particularly significant range of threats, uh, some of which are actively uh, aided and abetted uh, by uh, the regime in Iran. Now there's broad consensus because of the array of threats against Israel. There's broad consensus from the far right in Israel itself to left-leaning supporters of Israel in the Jewish diaspora, that Israel should be orders of magnitude stronger than any other country uh, in the region. And the way this manifests uh, are, for example, uh, in conversations here in the United States and in our legislating and our, our policymaking regarding the qualitative military edge uh, that Israel has and that the United States has committed uh, as a matter of agreement and law to maintaining. Uh, and obviously it also manifests uh, in the policy discussions and the politics around uh, the issue of Iran's nuclear uh, program. Um, now, I think it's well known uh, that the political class in Israel uh, is broadly and fairly stridently opposed to the JCPOA, as it was uh, agreed in 2015, uh, and that opposition was uh, uh, brought, in a sense, uh, to the United States quite clearly by uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, in 2015, by his uh, ambassador at the time, Ron Dermer, and of course by American pro-Israel organizations that you know have been on the scene here in Washington, D.C. for a number of decades now. But there's a really important other side uh, to this as well. Uh, and that is that if you look at Israeli society and the Israeli security establishment itself, that is Israeli security professionals, more often than not uh, uh, former or reserve, very senior officers from the Israeli Defense Forces, Mossad, Shin Bet, etc. Uh, you actually uh, come to realize that they overwhelmingly supported the JCPOA at its inception in 2015, uh, and again uh, opposed Donald Trump's unilateral violation and abandonment of the deal in May of 2018. J Street, uh, I, I remember in the summer of 2015, working very long days, having 10 meetings a day or more with members of Congress still on the fence about whether they were going to support the JCPOA or not. Uh, and I, my job was to bring uh, some of these former Israeli security officials uh, uh, around to these offices. Uh, and, you know, that had a really big impact on the understanding here in the United States about the true value of non-proliferation agreements such as these to Israel's security. There's one other aspect of this that I think people often overlook, and that is that Jewish Americans also overwhelmingly support 
the JCPOA and the diplomacy first half uh, with Iran and, and on a range of issues in the region. Around the time of the JCPOA's inception in the summer of 2015, there was just above majority support in the Jewish American community uh, for the JCPOA, about 54%, 56% support, depending on the polling you looked at. By the time that Donald Trump abandoned the agreement in May of 2018, that support had risen to the mid 60%, uh, about 64% of Jewish American voters opposed uh, uh, Trump's abrogation uh, of the deal. And when you come to our most recent election night, November 2020, that uh, ultimately saw uh, uh, not only Democratic, uh, the Democratic Party retake the White House, but eventually the Senate as well, as well as maintaining the House of Representatives, fully 74% of Jewish American voters supported JCPOA reentry as had been pledged by then candidate Joe Biden. Um, so you really do have strong support uh, among the Jewish American community uh, and among the Israeli security establishment who see uh, in, in large part, the JCPOA as a first step to other essential agreements. Um, and I, as others on the call, Kelsey and Jamal in particular, have made clear, laying out the, the challenges and considerations as well as the opportunities to JCPO reentry, we should have no doubt that it is the, the precondition and the first step to making progress on any other aspect, whether it is a WMD free zone or whether what it is other regional arrangements that take us in that direction. And right now, of course, and I think Kelsey uh, uh, discussed this as well, uh, a regional approach to things is very much in vogue uh, following the uh, uh, achievement of the normalization agreements between Israel and a handful of Arab states. But I want to be clear that there are two flavors uh, of uh, regionalism here, two flavors of a regional approach. One that is truly multilateral, one that you know embraces the good aspects of Israel normalizing, with some of its uh, Arab partners, but also recognizes that there are elements of this deal which take us, these uh, uh, deals which take us in the wrong direction, whether it's the side agreements related to arms, uh, increased arms sales to Gulf states, whether it is the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, acceptance, if you will, or recognition of Moroccan sovereignty over Western Sahara under Donald Trump, uh, and whether it is the fact that these agreements are often openly touted by opponents of a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as a way to flank the Palestinians and undermine their legitimate national uh, aspirations. Um, so a truly multilateral approach tries to use the good elements of these deal as a springboard for other regional agreements that not only address critical conflicts that remain like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in a regional context, uh, but can over time as they enter other areas of concern like Iran's regional activities, like support for terrorism, um, uh, like follow on agreements on the nuclear file, that over time the United States can continue to engage diplomatically, but step back militarily from the region. That's the more multilateral approach. The other flavor of regionalism, of course, sees these recent normalization agreements and any further talks uh, as an effort to try and get the United States firmly and 100% in the camp uh, of Saudi Arabia and its Gulf uh, allies uh, to, in a sense, deepen U.S. involvement uh, to uh, a regional uh, power conflict that is not, uh, at the end of the day, largely in U.S. Uh, interests or the interests of the, the people uh, in the region. And, you know, I want to be very clear about the fact that uh, people uh, on both sides of this divide can talk about the benefits of, of a regional approach, but oftentimes they're looking at it from two very different perspectives. Obviously, uh, J Street and Jewish Americans tend to look at this from a sense of opportunity for a truly multilateral approach, and we want to very much avoid uh, 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 regional uh, steps that would further this divide uh, between the Saudi Gulf 
uh, alignment uh, and, 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 and Iran. Uh, instead, we want to see regional agreements and diplomacy used as a way to lower the temperature and actually allow the United States to uh, disengage militarily from the region. And so to the extent that agreements and diplomacy can be advanced following re-entry to the JCPOA in that direction, I think you will find support from the Jewish American community to the extent that those agreements actually do reduce threats to Israel posed by Iran uh, in a meaningful way, like the GC JCPOA reduced the nuclear threat from Iran, I think you could also therefore expect to see Israeli security establishment uh, support, of course, depending on the details of those moves. So let me stop there uh, and leave plenty of time for questions.